All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. My name is John Mueller. I am a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, where webmasters and publishers like you all can join in, uh, ask your webmaster web search-related questions, and we can try to get you some answers. Uh, we have Martin joining us today. Uh, so any fancy JavaScript questions, I'm sure he'll be good to go. Yes. Um, but I'm sure we have tons of other questions as well. So if any of you want to get started with a question, you're welcome to jump in now. Everybody. I have a, I have a question related to JavaScript rendering. And uh, Martin, you're, since you're yes. here. Uh, so uh, in, in the new version of Google Search Console, when you do the fetch and render uh, uh, element there, uh, if, if, you're, if, you're things, if your content is not appearing in there, is it safe to assume, assume then that no, that's something that Google's, that Google's not going to find? Uh, generally speaking, yes. So um, the testing tools sometimes are not able to fetch certain resources due to various constraints and, and certain like things that we are working out on. Um, but generally speaking, if we can fetch all resources and the content does not show up, then it's likely that it's not going to be indexed yet. OK, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. That's what I'm here for. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I have questions related to Google Search Console. Uh, I have around 40 sitemap XML files in my sitemap index XML. Uh, and I have around 1,47,000 uh, web pages. Um, but uh, in the Google Search Control status, it shows only 65,569 URLs have been discovered. Uh, may I know, is there any mistake in my sitemap index or, is, uh, or any issue which I can be fixed or, or from the Google end? Whoops. I, in, in general, the, the, the thing to keep in mind is we generally don't index all pages that we know. And uh, so okay. even though we, we might know a lot of URLs from a sitemap file, it doesn't mean that we automatically index them. Uh, okay. So kind of, that's, that's kind of the, the first step. So it's pretty normal for, especially for larger sites, to have a lot of okay. pages that, that are known, but they're not indexed themselves. OK. OK. Um, so I, I wouldn't kind of, kind of panic and try to think like you're doing anything wrong. Uh, what you can yeah. do to make it yeah. a little bit easier is yeah. to internally link those pages better so, mm -hmm. so that when we find one page in your website, we can discover all of the pages on the website, even without okay. doing the sitemap file. OK. Uh, but uh, the how many have URLs have been discovered? But where can I check that status in the Google Search Console? Um, that's in the coverage report. That should be in there. OK. And the coverage report also shows 65,569. Uh, but even I am doing internal crawling, and I have around one lakh forty-seven thousand, which I can do, which are linked. Even I am doing the same process, which I can do, and I have figured out one lakh forty-seven thousand. But why is Google not able to do those? I I think if the internal linking is well within your website, then it's probably just a matter of well, Google knows a lot of URLs, but we we don't index all of them, and uh, that's not really a matter of a technical thing. It's more that. We, we've seen a lot of pages from this website, but we're not sure if it's worth indexing every one of them. So we index as much as we, we think makes sense. And if we okay. see that this website does really well, that it's an important website overall, yeah. then we okay. try to index more. OK, thank you. I have one more question. In the coverage section, yeah, in the coverage section, uh, you say the sitemap, sitemap's red, right? Yeah, in the sitemap index XML, I have 40 sitemap links. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the sitemap red section, there is no results displayed. There are zero, zero results. Um, I don't know. That's hard to say. 
uh, what what I would do there is may maybe post that in the Webmaster Help Forum with, with a link to your sitemap file so that someone can okay. double check to make sure that everything is OK there. OK, fine. Thank you. Sure. All right. Let's look at some of the questions that were submitted. Um, new people keep joining, which is great. Um, I think there's a little bit of noise somewhere. So let me see if I can mute some of you. Uh, feel free to just unmute if there's anything on your mind. Um, let's see. Got hit by the June core update. We're now working on quality content. How many months do I have to wait for recovery? Uh, I, I mean only a chance of survival in case of the next core update, or can Googlebot decide to remove a penalty without any core update? So I think, first of all, a, a core update is not a penalty. Uh, it's not a matter of the, the Google algorithm saying this is a bad website. It's essentially just saying, from, from the way that we determine which pages are relevant, we, we've kind of changed our calculations and found other pages that we think are more relevant. Uh, so it's not a matter of doing anything wrong, and then you fix it, and then Google recognizes it and shows it properly. Uh, but more, it's a matter of, well, we, we didn't think these pages were as relevant as they originally were. And these kind of changes, they can happen over time. Uh, we have a whole blog post that goes into fairly well detail on what we look at with regards to these core updates. So I, I would double check that. Uh, with regards to kind of seeing changes in one core update, and when would you see the next batch of changes, if you make significant effort to improve your website, for example. Uh, in general, this is something that happens on, on an ongoing basis. Uh, so on the one hand, we have the core updates, which are kind of bigger changes in our algorithms. And on the other hand, we have lots of small things that keep changing over time. Uh, the whole internet changes over time. And with that, our search results are essentially changing from day to day. And they, they can improve from day to day as well. Uh, so if you've been making significant improvements on your website, then you should see these kind of subtle changes over time as well. Uh, so it's not a matter of waiting for a specific change to, to see those changes in effect. Uh, but again, the, these core updates are not a sign that there's anything bad on your website, that there's web spam on your website. It's essentially just a way of us recognizing or trying to recognize the, the relevance of individual pages for individual queries. John, can I also ask something regarding uh, uh, content overall, not necessarily regarding the update? Sure. Uh, so we work with a fairly authoritative website, and they have a large blog section. And uh, it's, it's fairly popular, and we notice every time a new blog post uh, uh, is published, it tends to start ranking and attract uh, attracting traffic fairly fast. Like within a month, they're already top ten for uh, fairly competitive keywords. They start attracting traffic. Um, so we created a new section on the website. Uh, it's kind of more for evergreen content, like guides and things that don't typically expire. Uh, but it is essentially, uh, you know, we're still talking about articles uh, in the same niche. But we noticed that with this new section, uh, the articles published there tend to start ranking uh, much less slowly. Uh, so they, they attract traffic much later than uh, uh, posts that are published within the blog section, the existing blog section. So is it something that you know, matters to Google, whether uh, Google trusts certain sections, like subfolders or anything like that? on the website in terms of it sees something new. I don't know what that is about. So I'm, I'm kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of testing it more a bit or anything like that. I, I don't think we, we have anything in, in that direction. So not that we would say, like, this is a blog. We must rank its content quickly. And this is a wiki or an FAQ page. We should rank it slowly. I don't think we would have anything like that. Uh, what you might just be seeing is that within a blog, um, sites that, that are built up, for example, on WordPress, they have a fairly well set up internal linking. And they have an RSS feed. And they have kind of all of the whole setup for making content easily available. And you might not have it set up 
similarly optimal for the other parts of the website? Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of guessing there. Um, but it's not that we would say a blog should be treated differently than a normal web page. Well, uh, so let's assume both our blogs is just that one of them is in a brand new section of the website that Google hasn't, you know, so instead of slash blog, it's, I don't know, slash guides or something like that. Uh, but Google hasn't seen that section before. Uh, would, would it kind of, uh, you know, split it away from the rest of the website and kind of treat it differently in terms of let's test it to see whether you're going to publish uh, actual quality content there for like uh, some time? I I don't know of anything where we would split it off like that. So trying to, to think like what, what the options might be where something like this can happen. I think with, with adult content, that, that might be possible. If we think like a part is adult content and the rest is not, that might be something that plays a role. But it sounds like that wouldn't, wouldn't play in there. Uh, otherwise, the the only thing that I I have seen is that sometimes from from a pure crawling point of view, we might crawl different parts of a website with different speeds, uh, just because we think like these these parts of the website are updated more quickly than other parts. Uh, but if you've had kind of these regular updates on both parts of those web of the website for a while now, whoa, uh, then that's something where I. I wouldn't think anything like that would be playing a role. So uh, that seems like something where probably it's just, I don't know, our normal algorithms at play and not, uh, not something special that comes from it being a different part of the site. Uh, I'm asking only because we kind of tested it. So we published something on the guide section. Then a week later, we published something uh, uh, on the, well, it's uh, different topics, of course, but kind of the same process. And not necessarily one is more competitive than others. And the one published in the blog section just ranked right away. Uh, the other one is kind of struggling. And it keeps building up in impressions just much, much slower. So we didn't know whether it was anything special about that new section. I don't know. I, I mean, in, in your case, I, I would just keep on testing. Like, try, try to figure out if you can narrow things down. Maybe it's something kind of unique. Maybe it's just that you recognize, OK, well, if Google sees it like this, I will just put my content here. Um, that might be kind of the other approach. But I, I would keep an eye on it. It sounds like, sounds like maybe it's something spe specific with your website. I, again, I don't think we would do anything like that by design. So it's not that someone has hard coded something like saying, well, blogs are updated like this and other pages like this. Um, yeah. But you, you mentioned RSS feeds and everything related. It is a WordPress-based website. And indeed, the blog section does have everything that you mentioned, and the guy, that other section does not. Uh, but wouldn't that just help with indexing, not necessarily ranking? So yeah. once the content is indexed, would it perform differently if you don't have those elements? No, no. Uh, RSS would help with indexing, yeah. Okay. But uh, so sometimes there are things within a blog where you have like like the category set up, or you have kind of the the monthly overview pages that link to the individual art blog posts. You kind of have this internal linking fairly well optimized, and depending on how you set up the website, other parts of the website might not have that kind of well optimized internal linking, and that right. that kind of internal linking that could play a role with regards to ranking. OK, we'll check it out. Sure. Thanks. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, for search queries made in Google uh, from a desktop computer, our m dot domain ranks for some of our very important keywords. Uh, it seems to us like this is a bug on Google's side. And then there's a link to forum thread. Um, I didn't check the forum thread, so I'm not quite sure exactly what you're seeing. but. Uh, one of the things that, that is worth mentioning is that, especially with the shift to mobile-first indexing, uh, if you have a separate M. site, it's more likely that something like this can happen, uh, in that we might show your M. version in the normal desktop search results. 
And often that's due to kind of an inconsistent uh, linking between the mobile and the desktop version where we can't map that exactly. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of kind of the way that we crawl and index pages where maybe we'll pick up one version first and we'll see the canonical and we'll stick with the M. version because that's kind of the one that we would choose as canonical there. Uh, and we would show that. So from, from our point of view, with an M. site, uh, with mobile-first indexing, it's more likely that you would see the M. version in the desktop search results. Um, because of that, what I would do is make sure that you redirect desktop users from the M. site to the uh, appropriate desktop site. Wait, desktop users to the mobile site uh, to the appropriate desktop version. Uh, so kind of catch it on your end rather than rely on Google showing the appropriate URL. Uh, this is a bit similar to the situation before mobile-first indexing, where sometimes we would show desktop URLs for an M. site on mobile. And essentially, it has just kind of shifted around here. And uh, this is something from, from the mobile-first indexing team. I, I talked with them about this uh, earlier today. And uh, from their point of view, we, we do try to catch this as much as we can, but we can't catch it completely. And at the moment, uh, we're, we're thinking that this is probably something that over time will become less of an issue anyway, because people will redirect. And uh, more and more people are using mobile anyway to search. So uh, it's something where we would expect that potentially, if you have an M. site, this will kind of remain in, in a kind of an unstable situation like this. Um, again, what, what I would just do there is make sure that you redirect from the M. version to the desktop version for desktop users. Uh, that also helps us to understand that connection better and to show the right URL at the right time. Uh, so that's kind of the, the best way to handle it, or, or rather, the, the easiest way to handle it. Uh, of course, the best way to handle it would be to use a responsive site or you, to use dynamic serving, you, where you just have a single URL uh, where you don't have all of these differences between the M. dot and the desktop version. Um, because every time you, you have a separate mobile version or a separate version of the site, again, it just makes everything a little bit more complicated. So it's not that we will stop our support for M. dot versions. It's just that. If you have this setup and we've shifted to mobile-first indexing or we're shifting it to mobile-first indexing for your site, then it's possible that you will see this. Hi, John. Hi. So um, yeah, the question was from us. So um, uh, thank you very much for, for stepping onto it. Um, yeah, the case is we, we actually didn't receive any notification from Google in the Search Console that we would be uh, on mobile first yet. So, um, and the re redirect from, from mobile to desktop is there. So, setup should be stable. But it was, uh, yeah, last week that we, that we noticed not only for the German market, so since we're um, uh, having products in, in many markets, we realized it has been in the UK, in, in other markets too. And mobile... we have the right canonical and the right alternate. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we have done everything Google recommends. So yeah. we're pretty sure we've done the setup well for a separate UL situation. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, actually, it's really uh, painful to see it. So. Yeah, but I mean, if you have redirect set up for desktop users, then they will see the M. version, but they'll be redirected to the desktop version anyway. So it's something where users wouldn't wouldn't really see it as much. Uh, but uh, I agree, it it does look weird. And we have also lost rankings. You that wouldn't change anything with the rankings though, because. Uh, it's it's not that these these pages would rank differently. It's essentially just the URL that's being shown. Okay. So if if you're seeing changes in the rankings there, then that would be due to something. Another else. problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Someone with a question in between. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, it's also regarding these mobile uh, versions. So we do our best to follow your guidelines and rent is 
uh, mobile usability test and it it went quite well so it checked your site like uh, several thousand pages and then stopped at the last 20 or 20 something pages and now for weeks nothing happened so we think it maybe it has frozen or something but we have have no influence to change this so what could this be i don't know if you could follow my question so this mobile usability test you have on your uh, search console okay I, I think you asked this question in in the the post as well is that correct yeah yeah okay. i even gave a link yeah so i i took a quick look at uh at the site there and uh from from our point of view it looks pretty okay in the sense that the the mobile usability report i think is around 20 pages that is still flagged uh, as having issues with mobile usability and uh, the majority of those the, the pages that were flagged in the past they they have passed the test in the meantime uh, so that's something where I would say you're you're essentially okay now it's not uh, not that there's anything remaining that you really need to do there because the, the numbers have gone down significantly from uh, kind of the numbers that were shown earlier on so I yes so I, I think but, that's but well, much okay. it would be good to see it would be good to see that the number is zero but somehow it doesn't happen yeah that's that's sometimes tricky because there, there can be technical reasons why individual pages don't pass the, the test and the next time we we try the test then it works again uh, uh -huh. so for for a larger website a lot of times the these errors will will fluctuate a little bit close to zero but not completely zero uh-huh okay so you you we can't do much just just wait maybe one day it will yeah. be zero I, or... I i don't know if it will be zero uh <laughs> i i think i think it will be, remain fairly low uh okay. may, maybe i don't know like like a really small number, but uh, it, it doesn't always go to zero, and that's that's fine as well. Okay, and it doesn't influence the ranking, correct? If, or ranking. If these are ran random pages on your website where the the test sometimes doesn't pass, that's not not a problem because the next time the test runs, it'll be okay, and then th things will be okay again. Okay, thank you very much. That was sure. all. Thank you. Sure. OK, um, then a structured data question. We are a new site. We recently updated our schema setup. Uh, we used to have an organization script as well as an article script. And I, I think the, the change that was made is to move the organization script into the article script uh, so that it's not separate anymore. Um, I, I took a quick look at the, the website. I think it's linked. And uh, from what I can tell, it, we pick up both parts of the markup fine. So we, we pick up the uh, organization markup. We pick up the article markup uh, with the logo as well. So I think that's something where, where you should be fine. Um, you also mentioned the structured data testing tool says that it's valid, but the rich results uh, test doesn't necessarily show it. The, the tricky part with the rich results test is that it only shows a very limited number of structured data types. Uh, so what you might just be seeing there is that the rich results test doesn't specifically show that setup that you use. Uh, so from my point of view, I think you're all set. Nothing much to do there. Um, parts of my website produce hundreds of 500 errors for four days. Uh, when the error was resolved on the fifth day, I lost many rankings. Even now, after one month, the rankings aren't back, and many pages are not indexed anymore. I tried to index these pages again with Search Console, but they're still not indexed. Is there anything I can do to help get the rankings back, or do I have to wait? Uh, so there, there are two, two things that generally happen with regards to 500 errors. Uh, so 500 errors are normal server errors, where basically the server is saying, I, I don't know what to do. Something is broken. Uh, from our point of view, 
we, we do two things there. On, on the one hand, when we initially see them, we slow down the crawling. Uh, and we do that across the whole website. So if we see a lot of server errors coming, we will slow down the crawling because we want to make sure that we're not the ones that cause this server error. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, if we see server errors persisting for a longer period of time, uh, that could be, I, I would guess, around three, four, five days, maybe a week or so. Uh, then what will happen is we will think that these server errors are actually permanent errors. And uh, we will drop those pages from our index and treat them more like a, a 404 page, where we say, well, every time we try to access this page, a server tells us there's an error. So maybe we should stop accessing this page so much. Maybe we should stop showing it in the search results. Um, I suspect that's what happened for, for these cases in that uh, we, we saw them as a server error for a number of times, and then we removed them from the index because we thought this is a permanent error. And uh, essentially, the, the next step here is once we can recrawl them properly again, uh, which we do automatically over time, um, when we can recrawl them automatically and we see normal content again, we will show them in the index again. So usually, this is something that happens on, on an ongoing basis regularly. We just retry old pages that we know or that we think might not exist, and we double check to see if they still are missing or if they currently have content again. If they do have content again, we'll try to index them normally again. Uh, so if you're looking at a time, say, a month after a number of server errors, I would assume that might be right around the time where we start recrawling a little bit more again. Because if we see a page return an, kind of an error for a while, then we think maybe we don't need to crawl it as much anymore. But a month seems like a reasonable time uh, to double check again. So my guess is around about now or like one, two months after this kind of situation happens, we would be able to kind of go back and re-index a lot of those URLs and get them back in the search results. And when we can index them again, they can appear in the normal search results again. So it's not that they will start at 0. They will essentially be at the same state as they were at the time when they fell out. Uh, you, can, you can speed this up a little bit by using a sitemap file to tell us that these pages have changed and that we should go and recrawl them fairly quickly. Uh, you can also use the inspect URL tool and the submit to indexing tool in, in Search Console to let us know that these pages exist again. Uh, the tricky part, of course, is that you need to do this on a per page basis. You can't say, recrawl all of my website now, Google, uh, but rather you should say, like, these are the 10 or 20 most important pages that are missing now, kind of double check these pages, Google. And you have to do that individually. Uh, so that might be something that you're seeing there. Uh, but in general, this wouldn't be something that would have permanent effects. It could have effects for kind of a temporary time, maybe, I don't know, a couple of weeks, a month or so. I, I would guess could, could be normal if you don't do anything special. Um, but afterwards, things should settle down in the normal state again. If you see afterwards, after a couple of months, that it's still it's indexed, but it's not ranking as well as it used to be, then that seems like it would be a normal ranking change and not lit tied to those errors that you had in the past. Because once we can re-index those pages, we see them as normal pages again. Uh, there's nothing kind of special holding them back. It's just a normal page. Um, could the incorrect use of a very header uh, response using user agent uh, inhibit that site from being moved to mobile-first indexing, for example, providing a very user agent when the site doesn't actually use dynamic serving? It uses responsive design. Uh, so the, the very header in the HTTP result is a header where you can specify that this page changes depending on the user agent that accesses it. Usually, you would do that for a special mobile version. So if you have a mobile version, 
that is shown to mobile users and a desktop version that's shown to desktop users, and you switch those automatically, then you would ideally use this user uh, this HTTP header to let users and search engines kind of know about that. Uh, if you use it incorrectly, essentially that's fine too, because if you're telling us that a page is different depending on the user agent and we crawl it with different user agents and see the same content, then we still have something to crawl and index. It's not that suddenly we, we can't index that page anymore or we can't recognize that it works well on mobile. Uh, it's essentially just telling us, well, you should crawl this page twice, and then we crawl it twice and we see the same content twice. And from our point of view, it's not optimal. It's kind of like we're, we're crawling more than we would need, but it's not something that would, would be seen as any, any way problematic. Um, the, the other way around would be a bit trickier. If you're serving different content to mobile and you don't tell us about it, then we might not recognize that as quickly. Um, but in general, it's something we, we have a lot of experience with on the web. So we'll try things out. And if we see that it works, then it works. Uh, if it doesn't work, then we'll be kind of more on the safe side. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that mobile-first indexing is not a ranking factor. factor. It's not something that you need to have. It's not something that you need to kind of force in any way. Uh, if your site is not moved to mobile-first indexing, that's fine. It will continue to show in the search results. Uh, if it has been moved to mobile-first indexing, then it will still be shown in the search results. Uh, we'll just show them or index the mobile version of the, that site. Uh, so it's not that you would need to kind of push it to mobile-first indexing or that it's a sign of quality that you're with mobile-first indexing. From our point of view, it's essentially just a technical change in, in how we crawl and index those pages. It's not, not a quality signal. Um, after checking. Oh, I think this is the mobile usability test question. Um, I would like to migrate a site from the current subdomain, so example.wordpress.com, to a new domain, like example.com. I already set up the 301 redirect, but I cannot use the change of address tool in Search Console since I can't verify an already redirected WordPress subdomain. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to manage this type of migration? Uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, we we get that every now and then. Uh, you like people moving from a subdomain or moving to a subdomain. Um, people moving a, a subdirectory of a website to a different domain. Uh, all of these things are essentially normal site moves from our point of view, um, but uh, they don't work with the change of address tool in Search Console. So the Search Console change of address tool is really essentially moving from one full host to another full host, so copying URLs one to one from, from one side to the other. Um, you don't have to use the change of address tool. If you've set up 301 redirects properly, if you're doing everything else that we have in our documentation set up properly, then essentially we'd be able to kind of process that move anyway and treat it as a normal move. Uh, so from that point of view, the change of address tool helps us to speed things up a little bit. But even without that tool, we're sometimes able to process a site move within a couple of days. Uh, so I would double check the Help Center, which has a fairly comprehensive guide on everything that you need to watch out for. And uh, follow the steps there, and you should be good to go, even without the change of address tool in Search Console. Um, I recently discovered that I have tens of thousands of backlinks from my own IP address. It's not shared, and uh, twice as many from my IP address, but without the last number. Uh, should I be worried? Is it safe to disavow backlinks from your own IP address? Uh, no major changes to the website for quite a long time that could have caused this problem. Uh, so essentially, what what probably happened here is we 
somehow found the IP address. Maybe there is a link somewhere within your website or on a third party website. Uh, some, sometimes there are these kind of who is or website information websites that show the IP address. And uh, from, from that IP address, we were able to access the IP address. And uh, for whatever reason, we didn't see a redirect, or maybe we didn't see a rel canonical, and we started crawling that IP address. And if you serve the same website on the IP address directly as you have on the rest of the website, then we'll think, well, here's a nice website, and we start to crawl that website uh, within your IP address range, essentially. And uh, when that happens, if you have links to your normal website within that, then we will think, well, there is a link to this other website here, and we'll show that in Search Console as well. Uh, so from, from that point of view, like, that's kind of suboptimal, uh, but it's not, not bad. Uh, so it's not something that, that is a critical issue in the sense that you have spammy links or anything like that that you need to worry about. Essentially, these are links from your own website to your own website, just using a different host name, using the IP address instead of the host name. And uh, that's what we show in Search Console. Uh, what I would do in a, in a case like this is uh, try to find ways to reduce the, the crawling that can happen on the IP address directly. Um, you can do this by setting up a redirect, for example. Uh, you can do this by making sure that all of your pages have a rel canonical set to the proper full domain version. And uh, with that, that's something where if we discover one page on this IP address, we can try to crawl it, and we see the redirect to your normal website. And then, essentially, we crawl your normal website pro from, from there on. So that's, from, from that point of view, it's something that you can clean up. Uh, it's definitely worth cleaning that up, because if anything from your IP address is indexed in the search results, users might be going there, which is probably a bit confusing to them. Um, and uh, it's not something that you need to kind of disavow or process within the backlinks uh, report in Search Console. Uh, so I, I would see it as a sign as either currently or in the past, your IP address was indexable. You can fix that with the redirect and with the rel canonical. Uh, but past that, it's not something critical that you need to change. Um, one of my clients has health food-focused website and uses an ad network as one of the ways to generate revenue. The ad network uses JavaScript to generate text-based links. Some of the links are sketchy, uh, such as natural cancer cures, when the website has nothing to do with that. I was wondering if Googlebot would render those advertisements and potentially attribute the generated content to the website. Uh, should we be worried about advertisements potentially triggering an algorithmic penalty depending on what the ads say? Uh, we're looking to move away from this particular network or anyway because of the negative user experience. It's just currently in our waterfall stack as the last resort. Uh, so I, I definitely would look into this purely from, from a user's point of view. Uh, because users don't know where the content comes from on your website. They look at your website, and if you suddenly have a link to natural cancer cures and you kind of promote some third-party website with that link, then users might think that that's something that you're providing on an editorial basis. Uh, so that's something where, where I would be kind of cautious about that anyway. Uh, with regards to whether or not Google would see that as a part of the page's content, that's more a technical question in the sense of when Google renders these pages, does it see these links? And uh, you can test the rendering of the pages by using the Inspect URL tool. You can also kind of do a rough guess using the, the mobile friendliness test um, for pages that you don't have verified in Search Console. And with that, you can kind of roughly see is this script triggering? Is it showing content within the pages or not? Uh, oftentimes, ad networks are blocked by robots text. They're prevented from crawling by crawlers. So we probably wouldn't see that. Um, but uh, that's something that you can definitely check from, from a technical point of view. Um, but, but again, I would 
definitely also look at this from a user's point of view. And maybe there are also ways where you can continue working with this ad network and kind of have some of these more sketchy or more uh, kind of links that you don't want to have shown within your website kind of blocked. Um, Google's Guide to Mobile First Indexing doesn't mention differences in internal linking between desktop and mobile. If you have fewer internal links with the different anchor texts, could this impact rankings when a site is moved? Uh, yes, that's definitely the case. So if we index a site using purely the mobile version, and if your mobile version has less content or fewer internal links, or kind of missing anchor text, or missing images, or kind of just missing content in general, then we will index it with less content. So it's not the case that we would say, well, on the desktop site, there's it like this. On the mobile site, it's like this. And we'll do a mix of both. We'll essentially shift completely to the mobile version. Um, in general, when we check for mobile mobile first indexing, we, we have a kind of a readiness classifier internally. And it does look into things like this. So if we can tell that pages tend not to have any, any links on them anymore, or there's significant amount of content missing on the mobile pages, then we'll tend not to shift that site to mobile first indexing. Um, however, if you have a mix of kind of good and bad pages, it might be that overall our algorithms look at your site and say, well, in general, this is ready for mobile-first indexing. And we'll shift it over to mobile-first indexing, even though small parts of the website uh, are not completely ready for mobile-first indexing. Or similarly, it can be that we say, well, the site is ready for mobile-first indexing, and we shift it over. And there are kind of these subtle differences where overall it looks OK, but it's slightly different with regards to the internal linking. And it's not as optimized, for example, uh, with regards to the anchor text, or you haven't done it as cleanly as you could with regards to how you embed the images. Uh, all of these things are small, subtle things that we can't completely test for, uh, where you could theoretically see differences. Uh, so from, from my point of view, what I would do is really make sure that anytime you're testing your website using any external tool or a tool from Google or whatever, uh, make sure that you're testing the mobile version of your pages. Uh, make sure that you're testing with a mobile user agent. Uh, if you're using a, a website crawler to double check how your website is indexable, um, which I think is a great idea, um, then make sure you're using the mobile version so that uh, you're actually testing the version that Google would be indexing with mobile-first indexing. Uh, John, I've got a, another question, if you've sure. got a moment. Um, related to internal 301 redirects, uh, we have a fairly a large set of sites, uh, and we have a large volume of, of deep pages that have links, which are essentially 301 redirect to a final destination. Um, I'm wondering if those 301 redirects appear to be impacting um, crawl budget, and if so, is that something you'd re recommend? You know, remedying rather than having all these redirects internally that you've put in your code to go ahead and set those up to go to the correct destination without the three hundred one redirect. Um, good, good question. So I think it's always tricky with crawl budget because we we don't really show how much crawl budget a site has. And it's really hard to kind of determine what all is included there. Um, with, in general, when it comes to redirects within a website, if you're doing less than, I think it's five hops in one set, then we wouldn't count that against the site with regards to crawl budget. We would essentially just follow that set of redirects. Uh, if it takes more than five hops to, to reach the destination, then we would crawl that in a second round again. Um, but in general, when, when we're looking at website, it's really rare that a site has more than five hops uh, for a single URL to, to kind of access that. And sometimes you can trigger it artificially in that you, like maybe you know it's on HTTPS and dub, dub, dub. And if you access the non dub, dub, dub HTTP version, then you have like first the redirect to HTTPS and then the redirect to dub, dub, dub. 
which is something you could like artificially trigger, something where maybe you would have four or five hops to, to reach the destination. Uh, but if we're not actively crawling those URLs through all of those redirects, then that wouldn't have any effect on kind of the normal crawl budget. So especially if we've already found the destination page and we're focusing our crawling on the destination page, then I, I think you're all set, even if there are a couple of hops in between there. And re realistically, I think having more than five hops for kind of normal internal navigation, like an internal link leading to the final destination, that would be really rare to see. OK, thank you. Um, OK, let's see. We have a few more here. Um, we have an internal site, uh, international site that spans across multiple domains, .com, US, UK, DE, et cetera. Uh, recently, the .com has been dinged as a duplicate of the .us. And in the search results, the .com page's title pull in the US page title instead. Uh, what's the best practice in resolving this? Uh, we set up appropriate geolocations for all sites in Search Console, except for .com, which we left blank. Uh, we have a geo IP redirect set up on .com that redirects users from the US to the US site. Uh, but we don't have hreflang tags on .com or .us. Um, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure of what exactly you're seeing here. Uh, in general, if the content is the same on both of these sites, then we would see that, or we would potentially see that as a duplicate. And uh, we would potentially fold those together and show those as one version in the search results. Um, if you're redirecting from the .com to the individual country versions, uh, then we would see that kind of as a default home page for an international site, um, provided you use the hreflang markup for that. Uh, so with the hreflang markup, you would specify the .com version as an X default version. And uh, based on that markup, we would know that for this home page on the .com version, we have the DE, the UK, the US versions, for example. And uh, all of those versions have their own hreflang markup and a link to the X default version as well. Uh, so that's something where we would understand the relationship between those pages and be able to kind of show the appropriate URL at the right time in the search results. Um, if you don't have the hreflang annotations and you just redirect the .com users to the appropriate country versions, uh, what will happen is that since Googlebot primarily crawls from the US, we will see the US redirect. Uh, so for the most part, when we try to crawl the .com version, we'll see we get redirected to the US version. Therefore, we think, well, maybe the .com version is actually just the US version, and we'll just index the US version instead of anything else. Uh, so probably that's, that's something you're seeing there. Uh, the, the simple approach would be to use hreflang. Um, you can use hreflang on a per page basis. So if you're only seeing this for your home page, you can set up hreflang just for your home page. You don't need to set it up for the whole website. Um, the other approach that I guess you could do, well, I don't know. If you're, if you're always redirecting from the .com version, then probably hreflang would, would be the best approach here. Um, the, yeah, I, I think another approach might be to set up a separate version on the .com site that's not the same as your US site, but that seems like it would probably just confuse people more. Uh, so for, for this situation, I think the X default with the hreflang setup would probably be the, the best approach here. Um, how are pages that are often going to 404 crawled and indexed by Google efficiently, uh, like real estate information pages, uh, product details, and auction sites? Uh, should this content perhaps not be crawled at all? Uh, so essentially, it's so, so I think there are two aspects here. On the one hand, we can pick up these pages fairly quickly with something like a sitemap file, uh, which so initially we can index them fairly quickly. Uh, that's, I think, 
perfectly fine. If you know when these pages expire, for example, an auction that has a fixed date, uh, you can use the unavailable after meta tag to tell us that after this date, this page will be unavailable. And that makes it easier for us to drop it at, at the right date. Uh, changing them to 404 is another approach. Um, but there is a whole kind of almost like a separate strategy that you could follow with regards to pages that go 404. Uh, when you're talking about products that are no longer available, uh, auction items that are no longer available, real estate, or whatever, um, there, there are lots of different approaches that you can take here. And uh, I. I would recommend checking out some of the, the blog posts that are out there on how to deal with expired content uh, to, to get an idea for some of the different options there. So things you could do could be, for example, to keep the old page for a while and just say, well, this is no longer available. Uh, you could potentially redirect to, to a category page, which is kind of confusing to users. You could do that together with uh, a clean 404 page that you say, this item that you're looking for is not available, but here's the general category. Or here's a replacement item that's available uh, for this. Or you could just say, well, I, I can't be bothered with uh, understanding the details of these individual items. Like There's so many across my site. I don't know how they belong together. And in that case, just serving a 404 is perfectly fine. Uh, so what will generally happen in cases like this is uh, if you look at your server logs or if you look at the pages that are crawled, you'll see that Google finds a lot of 404 pages. And from our point of view, that's perfectly fine. It's not a sign that there's anything wrong with the website if it serves 404 pages. It's essentially just telling us these pages no longer exist. And from our point of view, we'll be like, fine, OK. We'll focus on other pages on your website. That's perfectly OK. OK, looks like we, we just have a few minutes left. So I'd like to give any of you a chance to jump in with the last question if there's anything critical on your mind. No last questions. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'll go ahead and try one. <laughs> Uh, it's actually something I've seen on the webmaster help forums. Um, somebody using, uh, I'm not sure what JavaScript framework it was, but uh, I noticed that immediately, so the source code of the page uh, would just have the head element with a, uh, with a meta title and you know some other tags, no content. Uh, and the meta tags were the same on all pages. And a few seconds, you know, after rendering, you'll uh, uh, get changed uh, meta tags, including the meta title, and added content, of course. Um, and the user was complaining that uh, for some of the pages, the Google selected canonical tag was the home page, even though the content of these pages was fairly different. Uh, so I'm assuming this is due to the fact that uh, maybe Google hasn't indexed the render version yet, and Google has just indexed the uh, non, uh, you know, non render version, pure HTML, and sees well. Basically, these two page are, pages are the same, so I'll just fold them into one before actually rendering and seeing. Oh, so it's separate content, different content. Do you want to take this one, Martin? Sorry, I have muted myself to not interrupt. Uh, I was distracted for a second. What was the question again? Sorry. Uh, no worries. Uh, I, I can send you the forum link afterwards. Uh, so it was uh, somebody who uh, is using a JavaScript uh, framework to render the content. Um, uh, the, the source content before any rendering is just the head element uh, with the same meta title across all pages. And basically, no content, just some JavaScript code there. After rendering, the meta title changes, uh, the content gets added, pages start to look different. Uh, and they were complaining that in, uh, in Search Console, um, some of their pages had the Google selected canonical tag uh, to the home page. So um, I'm guessing this is because Google hasn't rendered the uh, or hasn't indexed the rendered version of those pages yet. So they are just looking at 
the non-rendered versions, which basically look the same across all pages and fold them into one before actually, you know, rendering and, and indexing the rendered version, which is yeah. different. That is definitely possible. It can also be that there's some specific JavaScript error that prevents us from rendering it successfully, and then that would also happen. Because then in that case, if there's a render problem, then we basically see all pages as the same. As you said, like if it's not rendered, if it's not loading the dynamic content, uh, and then we have a case where we think that it's a duplication, and then we would collapse it into the home page, probably, or any page, really. Um, it would be useful to have the URL to be able to like look if this is a problem on our site or not on their site. But definitely send me the forum set, and I'll take a look. Uh, what I noticed, uh, I tested some of the URLs using the mobile uh, uh, rendering test tool, and mm -hmm. they seem to look fine. Uh, it seemed to render the uh, those pages correctly. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it is a, 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 a JavaScript error. Uh, I think it's just a matter of time before you know. It can be that it's a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just I'll just post the yeah. thread afterwards. Awesome. Thank you very much. Very good question. Cool. Yeah, I I think it's it's sometimes tricky with with these JavaScript pages, uh, in that uh, it's it's also really hard to tell what happened when Google saw it. Uh, where maybe it works now, maybe they changed something subtle with the framework with the setup, and now it all works, and it didn't work in the past, which is kind of like the the set of URLs that got. Uh, copy together, uh, and may maybe it's just a matter of time until things settle down again. But uh, always exciting. <laughs> cool. OK. With that, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, I, I want to thank you all for all of the questions that you submitted. Uh, thanks for joining in for the interesting questions that you had here live. Thanks for answering a bunch of the JavaScript stuff, Martin. Woo uh, and hopefully, I'll see you all again in one of the future Hangouts. Um, I'll put this on YouTube probably later on today. So if you want to watch yourself on the big screen, like, you'll be there. Uh, all right. And with that, I wish you all a great afternoon or a great day, depending on your time of day. And see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.